Hi. Uh, okay, so Tomán Noni, uh, he's um, uh, working here at DD UNAM uh, as a the GAPA postdoc uh, since October 2020. Uh, he's also co hosted by Aina. Um, uh, he got his PhD uh, from the, I will say it in English because in French it's very complicated, the Institute of Planetology and Astrophysics, uh, IPAG in Grenoble, you know, the Institute of Astrophysics in Grenoble in 2020, uh, 2019, um, working under the supervision of uh, Frederic Mott and Fabian Luba. Uh, then he stayed uh, for a short period there uh, as a postdoc working with Estelle uh, Moreau, more or less the pronunciation. And uh, he works mainly in the formation of massive stars in clusters using radio astronomy techniques. He has been a very important member of the ALMA IMF uh, large program collaboration. And uh, he came to IRIA to work with me on that. And we are working together towards releasing very large amounts of data and, ma and making nice uh, science with it as well. And uh, uh, I will uh, leave him to explain uh, these first results. Uh, so thanks so much. Thank you, Roberto. So, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I will talk about understanding the origin of the IMF from the mass distribution of calls. And uh, you can see on, on this slide the name of my main past and uh, current collaborators in, uh, in France and in Mexico. Yeah. Oops, did it work? Yeah. So to start, um, I guess that you're all familiar with uh, st stars and uh, stellar clusters, but maybe not with protoclusters, and I mean here molecular clouds and their substructures. Um, among the most important substructures in molecular clouds, um, we have elongated structures called filaments and cores as well. So since I will be talking about cores in all my presentation, I would like to propose a definition to um, to avoid uh, some uh, ambiguity. Um, we can say that a core is a gas and dust over density in a molecular cloud uh, and with the potential to form one or several stars or multiple uh, systems. Uh, first difficulty here is that uh, what people call cores can be objects of different sizes. In my presentation, I will call core structures between 0.01 and 0.1 parsecs. Um, for larger structures, you can find names such as massive dense core or clump. And for smaller structures, some people could call them fragments. And actually, fragmentation is one of the issues with the, with the largest structures, as well as the fact that uh, they are glove essentially bound or not. Um, the IMS, so is the uh, initial mass function, is the mass distribution of stars at birth. And it has long been thought as universal through the galaxy and possibly through uh, other galaxies through the universe. In it, there is different uh, formalism to describe it. Uh, the, in, the most recent are uh, Krupa uh, with the broken power law and Chabrier with a log normal and uh, a high mass slope. I will, uh, I will mainly focus here on, the, on this high mass, say, Salpeter slope, which uh, can be described uh, as a dn over dm proportional to m to the power of alpha minus alpha uh, uh, with alpha equal 2.35. So to understand the origin of the IMF, one could naturally think of looking at the mass distribution of 
stellar precursors to this course. And indeed, the mass distribution of cores has been found to follow closely the shape of the IMF uh, with a similar slope and uh, shifted toward higher masses. This, um, yeah, so that would mean that cores could be the direct mass reservoir available to form stars. Um, the similarity between the core and the star's mass function has been seen over the past two decades, first with the ground-based telescope, and then with the Herschel Spatial Telescope. Um, you can see here different names of, uh, of study. It's not a complete list. Um, so the first assumption is to think that IMF is determined by fragmentation at the prestellar stage. Um, one limit, however, is that most of the, the studies are probing low mass uh, stellar environment. The um, Orion here is, a, is one of the exception. It's one of the closest high mass terraming region. And uh, we have cores up to 20, 40 solar masses. A uh, second limit is that most of the studies presented, uh, listed before, are not typical of the, what we call the main mode of star motion in the galaxy, in the sense that uh, we are observing closed region. Uh, first observation, we are limited to the gold belt clouds uh, with uh, obese program clouds up to three kiloparsec have been observed, but yet we, we are still limited to a very specific type of galactic environment. Um, a second point to, know, to note is that uh, the IMF may not actually be so universal as we thought. Um, what we call top AV IMF, it is uh, with a slope below 2.35, has been found in different uh, Place uh, first in the well, first in a, in a starburst cluster of the large Ma Magellanic cloud by Schneider and collaborators, and as well in different young massive clusters near the galactic centers, such as the Archie, the Quintuplate. Uh, uh, so that could be a non a non environmental effect. Uh, those kind of regions are peculiar. We could also think that there is a uh, question. Um, oh, now let's see on which ground uh, this uh, CMF-EMS similarity rely. Um, to, to say that the CMF leads to the IMF, we need first to assume that the core mass that we measure is the total mass available from the stars. In mind that what we call core is a spatially limited uh, over density in the molecular cloud. So what about the impact of accretion streams toward high mass cores? Uh, if cores can get mass from larger scale, then it gets more complicated. What about subflow sub mutation if we are uh, drawing mass distribution of large objects? The second uh, assumption is that there is a uniform gas to star mass conversion. Um, but uh, some studies suggest that this parameter, uh, epsilon, could uh, vary and in particular increase with uh, the density of the medium. And the third assumption is that the, the common function that we measure is the true 
comma function, but um, there could be some variation of the lifetime of cores, their mass, for instance. Um, the IMF uh, is collected for some effect. Um, what about the uh, uh, star formation? Is it continuous or does it evolve with time? So you see that uh, the, we can question the assumption behind this comparison. To sum up this part, uh, I give you here three reasons to doubt about the generally accepted paradigm of a direct relation, the comma function leads to the initial mass function. First, observations of corn mass function were until recently mainly toward low mass forming region in a relatively local solar environment. Second, observations of the IMF suggest that uh, it is not truly universal. Uh, it could be uh, top AV in some particular environment. And finally, uh, the th theoretical grounds supporting this relation are very fr fragile. Now, as observers, what can we do for, uh, to, to progress? What we do is we need to explore uh, different kinds of environments to, to, to test this assumption and push the, the, the idea. So the blue 43 is uh, what we could call the, a particular environment and a different environment. On, the, on this scheme of the galaxy, uh, you see here, it is at the intersection of the galactic bar and one of the major spiral arm. It is also a distant star forming region at 5.5 kiloparsec from the sun compared to the other the aforementioned region. Um, and I call it extreme because um, it is first a very dense region and with the highest function efficiency. So, High some efficiency. Um, it's uh, in particular uh, the star formation efficiency measured by uh, Louvain and collaborators in this article, which found uh, an efficiency of about six to ten percent, which is uh, over the typical one two percent usually assumed. And also that the entire W thirty three region has been called a mini starburst because we, we found Starbucks clusters and we think that it can uh, probe, it can form high mass stars. Uh, a dense region, as you can see uh, in this uh, density map, there is a significant part of MM1, which is over uh, column density of 10 to the 23 uh, particle per centimeter squared. So dense, High mass absorption efficiency and cold as well, of course, um, on the Herschel um, temperature map have been measured temperature about 23 Kelvin. Um, below, you can see the, the cluster of massive stars in W43 um, I mentioned. So, observing distance regions means uh, that we need high angular resolution if we want uh, to really uh, observe the cores. And uh, high angular resolution in the millimeter, we are speaking about ALMA, so ALMA interferometer in, uh, in Chile. We have used observations of the early ALMA uh, time, so in cycle two, observed between 2014 and 2015, with uh, two configuration, um, 12 meter antenna, so the extended configuration and uh, the compact configuration. Um, what you can note here is that we are proving 
spatial scales between 0.01 and 0.5 parsec at this distance. Uh, the, for the spatial configuration, the strategy was to observe uh, a large uh, part of MM1, so between around two and two times one parsec in the mosaic mode of ALMA. Um, regarding the spectral configuration, we have in total eight spectral windows at 1.3 millimeter, so around 200 gigahertz. Um, one is dedicated to the continuum and the other uh, were focused on some uh, specific line, uh, strong line, such as CO, SIO, or certain CS. Um, you see now the image, uh, the continuum image of uh, w 3 mm one um, with different structures appearing. We see filaments, and we see some densest part here, and some cores appearing. So to detect core, cores, we have used get sources, which is a multi-scale algorithm. Um, it's a specificity that it can detect and uh, cause the, um, on single scale, single scale image. And also it is considering background and filament as, a, as a structures and it is a subtracting from this image background and filaments before detecting cause. In, um, in total with get sources, we, have, we detected 131 cores, including 94, which are considered as a more robust with a higher uh, signal to noise. Most of these uh, cores are uh, barely resolved, so they are at uh, angular uh, resolution at um, with physical scales close to the beam, uh, which is the mass of this core, uh, the classical formula was not sufficient. So what I call classical formula is uh, with the optically thin assumption uh, um, and it, it's in involving the integrated flux, the dust opacity kappa and the plant function uh, at the dust temperature TV. So instead we use uh, this formula which uh, take into account uh, and correct the optical thickness of, uh, of, of, the, of the course. And uh, actually it's, uh, it only change the mass for the six most, uh, for the six brightest core and it increase their mass between 10 and 35%. Um, and we came up with a, a large, uh, range of mass between one and 100 solar masses, uh, including 13 cores over 16 solar masses. And uh, why 16? Because 16 with, uh, with um, if we take a 50% efficiency, we got eight solar masses uh, stars. I would like to make a, a specific point about the dust temperature because it was a critical point for our, in our study. In the Herschel studies, I, I mentioned before, temperature was estimated from uh, spectral energy distribution using the different wavelengths of, uh, of Herschel. But you saw the Herschel temperature map before, it is at a resolution 10 to 20 times uh, worse than it. So it was not enough. What we used, is uh, the PP map method developed by Marsh and collaborators, um, which using the available observations from Herschel to Plateau de Bure uh, to um, Alma, construct uh, 
column density and the, um, temperature maps without degrading too much the spatial resolution. Uh, and what I mean here is that we have 2.5 arcsecond resolution instead of, let's say, 20. And uh, this, those are the large scale variation that you see on this temperature map uh, in the image between uh, 20 and 35K. So it is better than taking Herschel temperature, but it is not enough uh, to really take into account the variation of temperature at the core scale uh, at uh, 0.5 arcsecond. Um, we added local heating for the protocellar cores. So I will talk later about how we know cores are protostellar, so more evolved. Um, but I will just say for the moment that in MM1, um, we collected 12 protostellar cores. Uh, with, and uh, this gives temperatures up to uh, close to 100K for the, for the warmer cores. Um, so I mentioned course detection mass measurements. Now I have everything to show you the core mass function of W33MM1. It is uh, represented here in the cumulative form, meaning that instead of counting uh, cores in uh, bins, we are adding and counting the number of cores above uh, the different uh, mass thresholds. And please note as well that uh, I will use the dn over d log n convention for the slope. So in this reference, uh, the canonical Salpeter slope is minus 1.35. And what we found is that uh, the CMF has a slope of 0.96, which is significantly flatter than the canonical uh, IMF, even taking into, into account uh, these uncertainties. So, not only is it uh, much flatter, but it is also on a much broader math range than uh, the, the, studied, the study before. So, yeah, we can say that we have a, a top heavy core math function, and we can also say that we have an excess of high mass cores compared to. Uh, CMF following the Salpeter distribution. Um, actually, with ALMA, so over the two to three past years, um, many other studies found the top AV corner function. Uh, I took here this table from a, from a recent uh, article uh, gathering information about a different uh, region. Um, but yet there is still a problem if you want to use this table to, to compare region. Uh, there is a really inhomogeneous uh, sample here. Uh, first, some of these uh, studies uh, gather different region, which can be or not similar. The cores are not extracted in the same way. Some of them are using dendrograms, other uh, yeah, ghost clump or clump find. We can also think about different assumptions for the computation of temperatures. So yeah. it says that we can have top heavy CMF, but if we want to understand them, we need to, to do it in, a, in another way. So to sum up this part, we have seen in W33MM1 a core mass function significantly flatter than the canonical IMF. Um, other top of this IMF have been seen in, uh, in other regions. How can we understand it? First, it could mean that we will get in MM1 uh, an atypical IMF, so a top of the IMF as well. It, it's a possibility. I've shown uh, examples before of uh, top AV IMF. It could also mean that 
the CMF needs to evolve to, rec to recover the Salpeter slope. Um, the slope can get closer to Salpeter if a new episode of low mass star formation happen in the future. But on the other hand, we can also, uh, it can also get flatter if uh, core gains mass and uh, high mass cores become even mass more massive. So there is still many questions. Um, so to address this question, I will now present the ALMA AMF large program. Uh, so a large program, what, what does it mean? It means that a large amount of observing time is given for a single project. And we're talking here about the cycle five project, so more recent, uh, around 2017. 15 clouds uh, have been selected from the Atlas Gal Club catalog of a Sangerine collaborator. So, Clouds among the most massive protoclusters of the galaxy, with masses between two and uh, thirty-three thousand solar masses. Um, so the spectral configuration at one point three millimeter in point six was similar to the MM one observation uh, I mentioned before. And in addition, uh, all the clouds have been observed at three millimeter in one three, um, including lines such as N2H plus and H41 alpha. Um, the spatial configuration was chosen to be uh, again as in MM1 observed not only the center of the of each cloud, but the whole cloud. Um, in total, we have uh, 53 squared per sec when we add together all, uh, all the region. And um, an overview paper to present the project and the cloud uh, has been, uh, will, uh, will come out shortly. You can see in this table the name of the 15 region, and you can see where they are located on the on the same uh, scheme as before. So they have been selected to be between two and 5.5 kiloparsec, so to similar kind of similar distances to to have a homogeneous uh, angular resolution. They have been also classified as uh, young, intermediate, and evolved using two criteria, the one to three millimeter flux ratio and the free free emission. Um, so a few words about data reduction now. Um, you have to, to know that uh, ALMA, and especially ALMA large program, this represents a really huge amount of data. Uh, if we count 15 regions with uh, 12 spectral windows and 33 fields, we end up with uh, 30 teraoctet of flow data. So it's re this is really a lot. Um, actually, part of this data has been stored and reduced on the IRIA UNAM machine. And uh, we needed an homogeneous and reproducible data reduction process. This is why the Alma MF team developed a specific pipeline, which performs three main tasks, a combination of the different array configurations, deep cleaning, and self calibration of uh, the mosaic. The continuum data reduction is now finished and is presenting in a Innsbruck and collaborators, uh, which will also come out soon. soon. And the line data reduction is still ongoing. I, I won't go deeper in uh, the cleaning, just a few words to say that we use the MTMFS method. Uh, so both if you uh, multi-term and multi-scale 
to, to take into account image with a large flux dynamic and with a large spatial scale dynamic. Um, and also that the self calibration step has been uh, efficient and uh, leads to, to improvement in many of the fields. Uh, uh, you can uh, see an example here before and after self calibration. Uh, what uh, you can you can uh, appreciate the difference. Um, you see on this uh, slide uh, for each of the young intermediate and evolved region a three color image um, with a red for the one millimeter flux, so only thermal dust emission. In green, the three millimeter, which is both probing thermal dust and free free emission, and in blue, the H41 alpha, uh, which is probing only free free emission, so from ionized gas. And you can, uh, you can uh, see the difference between MM1, which is a young region with uh, only red and uh, green. And uh, for instance, G33, um, which is uh, evolved and with a uh, large part of uh, in blue uh, with the free, with free free emission. The data release will be uh, coming with a, a second paper of Ginsburg uh, and continuum image will be available. The core resolution strategy, uh, we use the two different types of continuum maps one with a reduced line contamination and the that we call the cleanest and the second with the maximal sensitivity, sensitivity possible selecting the whole bandwidth we have also used and compared two extraction software developed by a member of the consortium gsf uh, which is a successor of get sources I talked before, and get X2D, um, which is uh, still in development and which is uh, uh, which work with inflection point uh, in a similar way of Qtex. The the first step for uh, to study uh, the fifteen region has been to perform extraction on the cleanest map only and calculate mass with the constant temperature. Um, this will be the third Alma-IMF paper in preparation by Fabien Ville. So over the 15 regions, we end up with uh, about 700 cores detected with the uh, GTSF. Um, you can see on this mass exercise diagram that again, we are probing uh, to order of magnitude in mass with a limited uh, um, uh, scales in a physical scales. So between 1000 and 4000 AU for the decomposable size. When, when we take all these cores together we, and we compute the core mass function, we see that again the comma function is top heavy with a 0.0.91 uh, versus Selpeter uh, 1.35. So this, this uh, confirms and extend the result toward MM1. Uh, if, uh, if we um, draw CMF for each Subregion, so young, intermediate, and evolved, you have some clues of uh, distribution closer to Salpeter for the more evolved region. But take this with caution as uh, this is a work in progress. For the rest of the talk, I will focus on uh, other region of W43, MM2, and MM3 that can also be called ridge in the sense that 
uh, those are dense region um, on the same map as, the, as the before. You see them on the south of MM1 uh, with again a significant part below 10 to below uh, 10 to the 23 uh, column density. Regarding the classification, MM2 is considered as young as MM1, while MM3 is uh, considered as intermediate. And you will see in blue a, uh, an ultra compact H2 region. Now, here is a continuum map of uh, the MM2 and MM3 region. Uh, the cores you see on this image follow a different strategy than the global one uh, I talked before. Since core has been extracted on the Bsense image, which has followed a special treatment with the MNGSEC technique to reduce noise. Uh, and over the two mosaics combined, we have detected the close to two to 200 cores, well, that's really a large, uh, large core sample. Again, uh, a core mass function and uh, over the entire M2 and M3 region, the CMS is top heavy with, um, with a slope of 0.95. But since we have a large region and good statistic, we can also wonder how does it vary from one subregion to another? And actually, we see that uh, if we isolate the MM2 subregion, we see an even flatter mass distribution, while in the intermediate region in this filament called MM10, uh, the mass distribution is compatible with Salpeter. In MM3, it's more complicated. So what we could see here is that we are seeing a burst of star formation only in the MM2 uh, part of the region, which is also the densest uh, of the two. So to wrap up uh, this part, um, we found that the comma function for the 15 AMF clause uh, together is uh, also significantly flatter than the canonical INF. And this is an even more robust result because uh, we have more cores and we have an uniform methodology. And if we now want to look at the variation of these slopes, we can look at the evolutionary stage of this region. And for this, we see trend of, uh, uh, of closer cell pattern for multiple region. We have also started looking at the spatial distribution of cores within a region. And we think that we see a local burst of star formation. Um, but this is not, not enough. We can also wonder what about the individual evolution of the cores? Uh, does it make a difference between prestellar and protocellar cores? Well, to to, to present this last part, uh, let me just remind you that uh, there is uh, two main family of model for the, in high mass star formation, what we could call the core fed models. Uh, so in, the, in this, I put the gravo turbulent or core collapse model of, for instance, Machietan. And the other family would be what, I, what we call the clump fed model clump fed because uh, the mass reservoir for the cores is considered at larger scale. And here we, are, we will have the competitive evacuation of Codel and Bay, for instance, and also the global hierarchical collapse. And while high mass prestellar cores supported by turbulence and magnetic field are uh, predicted by the core fed models, no such cores are necessary for the other type of model. Um, for the second model, we could simply have solar type protocellar cores becoming high mass protocellar cores 
from accretion. But uh, observations from the past 10 years tell us that on the very few high mass prestellar core candidates uh, exist. I give you here a list of the five most robust uh, candidates, including one core of, uh, of uh, 56 solar masses in MM1. Um, now, how do we know whether our core is protostellar? A good way is the detection of, protos of uh, outflows, which, um, which appear as a bipolar, blue and red. So blue for the blue shifted part and the red for the red shifted part that we see as a line wicks here on the CO line. I won't go much into detail about the, about the outflow uh, themselves uh, because I just want to, to tell you that uh, over the whole core sample, I've detected 51 cores with outflow, either with a single lobe or with a bipolar, uh, bipolar lobe. So on this image, you have the continuum map as a, in gray scale and in blue and red contours, the CO high velocity uh, emission. It gets slightly more complicated when we add uh, CO at lower velocities. So now I can make this, dis this distinction between prestellar and protostellar mass function. And uh, actually there is a striking difference because the CMF of prestellar core is very compatible with Salpeter, a slope of minus 1.3, while the slope of the protostellar cores uh, is, uh, by contrast, even uh, more top heavy. So if we assume that we have a burst of star formation in MM2, for instance, uh, only protocellar cores are, uh, are fed in, the, in this burst. And this is also obviously the link to the, to the absence of the very little number of high mass protostellar cores found in, uh, in all regions. So what could it tell us? regarding the different model I presented earlier. Well, um, the both family of models can reproduce the Salpeter slope, or actually in some of them, it's maybe more the uh, minus one than minus 1.35. So, uh, but I think that the clump-fed models are more adapted than the core-fed models to explain variation of the comma function and especially to explain this difference between prestellar and protocellar core, in the sense that if protocellar cores can gain mass from large scale, then uh, we can more naturally explain uh, why some of them become, become uh, more massive. Um, so here are my conclusions with the LMAMF large program. We have really a wealth of data to investigate high mass star formation. Uh, 15 high mass clusters are imaged and classified from young to evolved. Uh, and uh, but almost uh, 700 cores have been detected, but this is only a lower limit because if we, are, uh, if we go deeper in the analysis, we can detect more cores. The three first articles presenting LMIMF results uh, will come uh, soon, as well as the continuum that I will use. Um, and we are really close to understanding the variation of the comma function. Uh, first, we can see that top AV comma function compared to Salpeter are not an exception in high mass terminal region. We see them uh, for uh, for most of our uh, region. We also found hint of variation with evolutionary stage of the region. 
we, we propose that in MM2, um, the excess of high mass cores could be due to a local burst of star formation. Um, and uh, we can also think that uh, the difference between pre-stellar and protocellar core mass function is uh, because only protocellar cores become massive. So I talk mostly about cores in this presentation, but uh, lines are also coming. Uh, the line data will soon be, de be delivered in the, in the first step only to the alma MF consortium. Uh, I'm preparing one of the first paper uh, using lines, uh, talking about outflows. And uh, we have two groups, kinematics and chemistry in alma MF which are active and uh, the two are really essential to complement and understand uh, cores. And uh, in the future, uh, we will uh, go deeper in the variation, in understanding the variation with evolutionary stage. Um, we will also compare the variation of the CMF with where the cores are lying and uh, large scale gas formation. And uh, finally, I think that uh, understanding the way uh, protocellar cores gain their mass and how it can vary from one subregion to another is a, is a good way to go. And uh, thanks for your attention. I will take question. Thanks a lot, Thomas. So let's see some hands for questions. Okay, Aina, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. It's a very nice presentation and very nice results also. Uh, regarding this variation that you find uh, of the IMF slope for from younger to more evolved regions, could it be that the younger ones are more top heavy, right? Yes. Oh. Could it be that the, the reason, the physical reason is that they are uh, still in the process of fragmentation? And so with time, you move from this top heavy to more saltpeter like because the most massive ones are sti still fragmenting, maybe. I don't know if you have considered this possibility. So at this stage, uh, we are still considering many hypotheses. Um, at, at the first, um, my first idea would be that I'm not, I'm not sure we would have, uh, why we would have a strong difference between the young and the evolved regions regarding fragmentation in the sense that we have size of cores which are similar. So uh, I, fragmentation may play a role, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a possibility, but I, I will not say it's my first guess for, the, for it. Yeah, Enrique? Okay, thanks, Aina. We have uh, Enrique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks, so much. <clears throat> this, this is very interesting. And I, uh, of course, you know that uh, I have particular interest in this topic. So I have lots of questions, but I can ask one or two and then see if somebody else has more and if not i can ask more questions but uh one of the first is did you test how much your uh slopes may or may not depend on how you define the course because you said that you used at least two different algorithms mm -hmm, yeah. uh, that's that's very good because in our experience the cores are very subjective objects right so uh, so there's no unique way to define them do you find any significant difference between uh, the different algorithms for example or for example your mass resolution or things like that so yeah in indeed uh, in the in the paper of fabien Louvé, he will uh, compare the the two different algorithms um, mm -hmm. So for the moment, actually, he's still uh, he's still trying to 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 
to, to get consistent results. So we see not exactly the same things, but we see, uh, but the trend for, uh, at least the trend of uh, uh, young and evolved, young and intermediate in one side and evolved in the other, is seems to be robust. Um, so for the moment, I don't think that uh, he studied uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, resolution, but um, if I look at, yeah, probably you, you have seen this paper uh, also, um, he's the first author, so he's, uh, so he's well aware of the, and we are well aware of the, of the issues of resolution. So mm -hmm. I think that in a, in a near future, we could, uh, we could, uh, it will not be so difficult to, for instance, uh, uh, degrade the, re the resolution and see if we, uh, if we have convergence mm -hmm. of the number of cores detected with resolution, uh, that, that could be totally a way to go. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I, I mean, the simplest example that comes to my mind is that, for example, if you have like a multi scale algorithm and you have higher resolution, then of course you will be able to identify smaller cores which will have lower masses. So that could affect uh, both the extent and perhaps the slope as to whether the, the, the IMF is top heavy or not, for example, no? That goes a little bit in the direction of Aina's question as to whether these cores could be fragmenting. And of course, if, if you don't, uh, don't resolve the fragments, then you won't have those as individual objects, right? Yeah. And so that would make for missing some of the low mass objects. So I don't know if that's the point. Actually here, the, with fragmentation, there is one important thing that if we want that fragmentation explain part of the slope variation, we have to assume that fragmentation of high mass scores is not the same as fragmentation of low mass scores. So this is again, something that is not trivial. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'll let somebody else ask and then I can ask another one. Okay. Thanks, Enrique. Uh, Rosa? Thank you, Thomas. I have very bad internet. I hope I can finish my question and I'm not going to turn on my video. So I wanted to ask you um, two things. One is how do you date the course to know that there is evolution? And second, I mean, it seems from what you are showing us that they, in the absence of another thing, um, the, IMF, the, the CMF will evolve to look like the canonical IMF. But for example, you were saying that um, when you're close to a very strong um, burst of star formation, it also looks flat. I mean, so there, would there be the possibility that if there is a burst of star formation, it will not evolve to the canonical one, but if there's no energetic star formation close by, it will evolve to the canonical IMF. Those are my questions. Thank okay, so, you, yeah. Thomas. I will try to, to address both. So there is, um, we, here we have to make the distinction between two kinds of, uh, of uh, evolution, of, uh, evol of evolution. We are, um, I've been talking about evolution uh, at, the, at the cloud scale using, uh, so this one millimeter to one to three millimeter flux ratio and the free free emission, uh, which, uh, which tell us where do we, where we have ionized gas. So with these two indicators, we can see uh, variation at the, at the cloud or at the sub region scales because actually inside one region, we can have a part which is more evolved than the other one. Uh, and then we can all, it's, it's very different. We have also the evolution at the core scale, whether it is prestellar or whether there is already a protostar inside and then it's protostellar and we see outflows, we can see maybe hot core, hot core and all these kind of things. So, those are the two kinds of, uh, 
two kinds of uh, variation of variation. Um, so now regarding the regarding the the slopes and the I we st we still need to, to to make tests to un to understand the link between the um, the top VCMF at the sub region scale as this one here in uh, in MM in MM two and the variation with uh, with evolution but um, yeah as I said um, I would be really surprised that. Uh, all of this uh, MM1 and MM2 uh, cluster, especially, give uh, IMF with a Salpeter slope. And um, I think that at least part of our clouds uh, will not give Salpeter distribution. Uh, yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Thomas. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks, Rosa. Javier? Javier, uh, go ahead. We can't hear you, Javier. Go with somebody else and I'll be back. Okay. Uh, Enrique? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I have, uh, uh, let's say, a, a couple of other questions because I think they can be quick. Uh, one of them is what is about the relationship between the CMF and the actual IMF. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know whether there's data already on the actual IMF of these same regions. So when, when you find a region that has, a, for example, a top heavy CMF, can you say that the IMF is also top heavy there? Or, do, or you don't know? No, the I... I think that from the for IMF region, maybe the best we can do, and I've never, and I've never found, uh, would be to look uh, nearby region already uh, having a stellar cluster. So maybe it, if the resolution was sufficient, we could uh, make IMF in this uh, uh, cluster here. But um, most of the time, uh, when uh, the when I'm the the region with cores and the region with stars are distant. So the, actually, the, the closest thing to what you say uh, could, would be to, to make the distribution of more evolved objects that simply cores. And uh, actually, with Roberto, we have a, um, and a, a student of Roberto has, uh, has, has done some work on this, on uh, um, trying to 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 compute the mass distribution of uh, H2 region and then of the of the protostars uh, inside the H2 region. So in the over the next years, we are we are plan, we want to, to compare this distribution of individual objects to the core distribution in W49. So that okay. that will be the closest thing I, I, I can think of to what you say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, of course you you don't perhaps you don't expect the two to appear at the same time, right? Perhaps the CMF mm -hmm. comes first and then the IMF comes later. Yeah. But uh, basically, my question was: Is there a population of uh, protostellar objects from which you could already try to obtain their mass function, or not yet? There are not there enough uh, protostellar objects there to do the statistics or? Or it's just a matter of resolution; it's too far away, and you cannot. It's, find it's it. more that we um, um, it's it's really here. We are really talking about uh, early uh, high uh, star formation, and uh, it's really uh, embedded phase. Uh, so mm -hmm. actually, almost by choice and by definition, if mm -hmm. we see um, if we see something in the millimeter range, then we will clear. Then we will see nothing at uh, at in at optical mm -hmm. wavelength. At best, we can see something in the infrared, in the infrared, but um, mm -hmm. uh, it's really different kind of regions and different uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. at the, so I don't think that it's possible. 
Okay. And then my, my other question is also relatively quick, I hope. You, at the end, you said, and of course, I like that idea, that the clump-fed models seem to be more adequate to uh, explain the CMF variations. But I didn't catch exactly why you say that. Uh, I would like to know what is the reasoning behind that statement. Yeah, so those are all really early thoughts. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will be happy to discuss this more in details. Mm -hmm. But um, the, my idea was that if we, um, the the idea of uh, of drew, of drawing the co mass function is that uh, the mass that you are measuring is somehow the mass reservoir of cores, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, if you you um, if you include protostellar cores, you have to pay attention that uh, you are not dealing with two evolved objects. For instance, if you start to have class one, class two object then maybe the mass in the envelope will will become an, too small compared to the and it will no longer be the mass reservoir of the core mm -hmm. so if we assume that uh, there is like a continue um, a continuum between low mass and high mass transformation and uh, that prestellar cores become protostellar with only a local mass reservoir then I don't see really why uh, we will have such a difference. On the other hand, if we if we imagine that uh, the high mass process are core here have uh, uh, in the past and uh, are currently accreting from larger scales, uh, if they are located at the right position, then it's uh, I think it's easier to understand. Uh, uh, why uh, they become more massive, uh, while uh, prestellar cores, uh, which are younger, uh, do not. Okay. I don't know if it's clear uh, if it makes okay. sense to you. Yeah, I, I understand now. Yeah, thank you. Javier? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, I was wondering, uh, sorry if I missed it, uh, probably you said it. Uh, it, it, you used uh, this um, get source uh, uh, algorithm, is, is that right? Yeah, uh, well, okay. get sources and get SF, yeah, but some, the same more or less. Okay, so my, my question is related to, to something that Enrique uh, mentioned. In this, in this uh, code, are you, for instance, getting the mass of a large clump and then the mass of smaller clumps inside it, or that's one clump in the, that will go in the in the massive beam, and then in other regions you will get different things. Um, the the way that uh, that uh, this uh, this type of uh, of algorithm is working is more to that there is a, a very long uh, step before the detection and the measurement, um, in the sense that before detecting cores there will be a step to estimate and remove uh, what we call the background and also the filaments. Uh, we will also have other steps to equalize the noise and to, to, and to separate uh, and to, to separate between scales. And only after this, we will have um, uh, a map with a different uh, uh, peak and the algorithm will detect all of these peaks, and in the last step, it will tell us which peak are uh, are cores, which one have sufficiently contrast with the background. So um, I don't know if it's answer your question, but uh, the, it's um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, for instance, if you use uh, uh, sorry, I don't hear you again. Sorry, uh, if it's you very use, low. For instance, um, clump finds. Uh, you, you get only one thing, one structure, and that will be one object, and, get, and then you get another structure, and that will be another object. But if instead you use uh, uh, the dendrogram, then you can get one thing, one big thing, and then inside that, you will get two different, uh, you may get different objects inside that. Yeah, yeah, I see. It has, it has similar structure. So no, it, 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 it is not like dendrogram. Uh, 
there is no. No, there is no larger structures. Uh, no. If it works in that sense, I wouldn't compare it with with the, with the IMF because in the case of the stars, you have one massive star that is not splitting several low massive stars. No, so I think it's uh, tricky to 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 define to decide which which uh, algorithm to to get. Uh, mm. Course, are you using? No? So, so just be aware of that. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, actually, I don't know if it was what you were saying, but it's, um, I don't know if it has already been done, but uh, uh, in principle, it's made, it should be possible to, uh, to with nanograms to, to, to have, have like two different scales. And uh, well, usually in nanograms, people are, are only interested in the smallest, in the leaf, but in principle, we could also look at how the what it looks like at um, mm -hmm. at, uh, la, at in the parental substructure, so and look how the mass is inside. So yeah, I I think it's a good idea to look at how the mass comes from the large to the small scale. Yeah, exactly. So and the other question is uh, in, in your histogram, you always show the cumulative distribution. Uh, yeah. And I think it's a, a, maybe tricky to use that because uh, that's softer always than the actual distribution, not, not the cumulative. So always integrating, by integrating, you make soft differences that may rise in, in, in the real mass function. No? So I would suggest you to, to, to do both comparisons. Mm, yeah, actually, in the, if you look at the Nature Astronomy paper of 2018, we show both, but it's true that um, usually uh, community, well, it is, um, it is, uh, it has been said and, and measured that uh, it is, it is like, it is more robust to measure on the cumulative uh, than on the differential form. So, uh, to my knowledge, it does not introduce any bias. It is only a way to to, to make the slope measurement more robust. But, uh, yeah, I think it's tricky. Because, I mean, you may think that it's more robust because it's softer, but it also, you may, you may be hiding uh, real things, but we can discuss that, that later. Okay? Okay. Okay. Well, okay. I guess, uh, uh, Enrique, if you have one question, go ahead. Enrique, if you have, sure. sorry, I was talking and talking with my microphone muted. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this is more a comment. Uh, I just wanted to mention that indeed in our simulations, and you probably know this, Thomas, uh, the IMF evolves. We have not measured the CMF, but the IMF certainly evolves. And now that you mention it, it is possible that it evolves to, to becoming uh, more top heavy first, and uh, that uh, the, the maximum top heaviness could be reached when you're forming the most massive stars, then the feedback be begin begins to disperse the cloud and then the star formation rate decreases also. And so it might be that we add a last little fraction of low mass stars. So it will be very interesting to compare your data to uh, of, dip of different evolutionary stages of the of the clumps with what the simulations predict i think that that, yeah, that would be very interesting mm -hmm. yeah we can discuss this more in detail yeah, yeah in, the, in the group yeah thanks Enrique, and uh, thanks to all the questions we have today uh, let's thank the speaker again <laughs> thank you okay. and uh, bye, bye thank you all right everyone have a good afternoon Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.